will take this opportunity while we're all in the same room to remind you the Common Good Vermont has many exciting, informative, and inspiring events all spring long, including our Finance Fridays, which will um, start next week on the next Friday. Finance Fridays, of course, it's on a Friday. It's um, on the 18th of March. Um, it's a live webcast. And it's on the subject of protecting yourself from fraud. So are you doing everything you need to do to make sure that your financial processes are in order and that you are not vulnerable to um, being taken advantage of within your organization? <clears throat> and what's really going to neat about this event is that you could watch it at your desk. Or you could go to one of eight locations around the state that will be hosting this webcast. So this is an idea that we have to build some regional networking capacity. So we have um, locations in Montpelier and in Brattleboro and in Manchester. And of course, you may come to the live studio in Burlington and a few other locations which are listed in your program. And that will be a really interesting event. And we're really hoping people will come. Wendell and Duquette, who is here, I think. There she is, the lovely Wendell, will be presenting. She has a lot of um, accounting and bookkeeping experience, and we are really excited about this particular program. So I just wanted you all to know that that's coming up, that that's coming up, and <clears throat> that we hope you will take advantage of that, especially to bring your board members and other key staff members. So um, we are going to, this is what we're going to do for the remaining uh, 45 minutes that we have. We're going to hear from Patricia Fontaine, who's going to share um, a story with us. And then Zahn Estes of Estes, Estes, Estes. I want to make sure I get that right, thank you, of the Vermont Council on the Arts is going to really give us a snapshot of their legislative agenda, which I think is a good um, best practice for us. And then we'll be talking about the data, data side of the house with our friends from Building Bright Futures, Sue Zeller, who's the Chief Performance Officer for the State of Vermont, and Drew Rusley, who is um, the performance manager. Well, no, you have a better title than that. Just left me. Only slightly better. Performance improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. At the Agency of Human Services. So without further ado, Patricia Fontaine, welcome. Thank you, Lauren Glenn. Hi, everybody. Hi. How about we just take a moment to breathe? Like, I don't know about you, but I'm so excited. I've been sort of holding my breath a little bit. So uh, it was a privilege to be asked to offer this dedication. I'm going to try to use the word dedication about four times. And um, I'd like to dedicate this dedication to all of those that we serve and whose stories motivate us for the common good. Uh, when I asked Lauren Glenn what she meant by dedication, she said, you're the refresher. So I said, OK. Um, then she said, oh, just tell a story about how your work changes lives and builds community. No pressure. So um, I'm going to start with a story. This is Donna's story. I was told I had cancer on December 26, 2009. It was stage 4 lung cancer. Having never smoked, I was confused and angry besides being extremely terrified. After surgery, I was clear for several years until April of 2014 when I found out it was back and in the lining of my right lung. This time, along with conventional methods, I'm using more alternative methods, including Patricia's art and writing class. It's helped me get in touch with my deepest fears and sadness, but also bring to light my incredible intuition on what I need to do to heal and stay sane. It's helped me so much I even write and create pictures at home to continue my healing process. So um, I'm a microscopic nonprofit. Since 2009, I've been teaching a class called Healing Art and Writing for folks dealing with illness and their care partners. From the beginning, I decided to offer the course for free and as a drop-in class. In my own journey with cancer, I found there were not many opportunities to use creativity to meet illness and those that did required the kind of attendance I really couldn't drag my to, myself to when I was in the thick of it, in the thick of treatment. What began as a six-week experiment has turned into a six-year adventure 
in witnessing the resilience and wonder of the folks who've come. The class has allowed participants to connect and collaborate about healing in ways I couldn't imagine and is so darn inspiring that we will actually be featuring some of their art from our upcoming book at this fabulous conference right here in Montpelier up at Vermont College on April 2nd at the free Expanding Cancer Care Conference. As I said earlier, the first of its kind in Vermont to offer an opportunity to explore choices and services in complementary integrative medicine. Here's Jane's story. What's healing about healing art and writing? Being able to say and mark on paper anything. Did I say anything? In words or colors makes me feel relieved and in possession of myself not at the mercy and mystery of a doctor and the ways they glide over my fears and questions, nurse, hospital treatment, radiation machine, or x-ray, or any of the rest of the hullabaloo that being me in my world entails. I have to live with the marks and holes and restrictions that cancer has placed on me, the limitations that age delivers, the loss. Writing and drawing some way make up for all the questions I didn't ask the things I didn't do well enough to make myself healthier, the body and life I'm not in absolute control of anyway. I have to keep reminding myself that none of this is my fault. Having health issues are part of being human. I'm on the way to the grave just like everyone else. Meanwhile, making my marks on paper gives me courage that I do have some power. This is what we offer to people in the nonprofit sector and with the people on, be, on whose behalf we work. So, um, and I just want to say, I'm a really small player. I basically show up and this is what happens. People are given an opportunity and a little bit of guidance and they're ready to go. So, um, I want to dedicate this poem to Marge Piercy in closing to all of you who really listen well enough to the stories to do the work you do and may you be well supported in it. To be of use. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves and ox to a heavy cart who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do things that have to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who stand in the line and haul in their places, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire to be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. <coughs> Botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing, well done, has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn, are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Thank you. We need to breathe again. Well, hello. As Lauren Glenn said, my name is Molly Lambert, and I'm the Interim Executive Director for Building Bright Futures. Uh, and I've been involved with many of you during the last uh, decades, uh, working in not-for-profits and nonprofits throughout the state. And what a privilege it is to be in this room. Uh, you feel the energy and the, the talent of the people who are gathered here 
to, as Patricia said, do the very best they can for the people they serve. Uh, when we speak about data, it goes a long way from the beautiful poetry that you presented to us, Patricia. However, it does help all of us do the work that we need to do in our communities. It makes our work more understandable, more accessible, not only to the people we serve, but the people we need to invest in those services. So let me just start by saying it is a privilege to be in this role at, at Building Bright Futures, which is the bridge, really, between our state folks and the regions and the communities where the action or the magic really happens. We are the backbone organization that facilitates important conversation that, that bolsters our regions uh, through regional coordinators, some of whom are here this morning. We monitor the Vermont Early Childhood Action Council. And more and most important for this morning's conversation as we speak about data and its role is that we are the program that hosts the Vermont Insights Tool. Many of you probably uh, don't recognize the name Vermont Insights, but I hope after this morning you will. This is a tool that Building Bright Futures was able to invest significant dollars in because of the race to the top money that came into our state two years ago now. It was a $37 million grant from the federal government, uh, and Building Bright Futures was responsible for two of the 24 projects that that grant is encompassing as it goes forward. When this project was established, it, or when the grant monies came in, uh, you all know very well from the work that you're doing from your not-for-profit seats and your advocacy seats, that data is critically important to getting the, the tools that you need to do the important work that you do. So um, during this uh, creation of Vermont Insights, and let me take a moment as Lauren Glenn so aptly described Kathleen as the brains behind the operation, which is terrific. Kathleen is the project director for Vermont Insights. And what Vermont Insights does is it creates a tool uh, that takes in data, analyzes data, gathers data about early childhood in Vermont. However, some of you, in looking at the data that is part of Vermont's insights, would say, well, that, that, that doesn't talk about the Child Development Division, or it doesn't talk about maternal health necessarily. Look at, they're talking about affordable housing. They're talking about economic conditions. They're talking about hunger. They're talking about myriad environmental conditions that affect our children. And the reason that Vermont Insights is a home for that data assembly is because our children grow up in communities. And it's really healthy communities, as well as the programs that directly serve them, that create the conditions where our children can thrive. So Vermont Insights is a tool that makes that data accessible, not only to policymakers that are articulating uh, policy and guiding investments at the state level, it makes it accessible to family members. 
It makes that data accessible to anyone who needs information about a particular topic uh, that affects early childhood or the economy or affordable housing or hunger uh, or substance use. All of these things can be found in that tool. The important part is that Vermont Insights is not a project that is set apart from the work going on in the state. Vermont Insights is a tool that expands on, perhaps expands, but enriches results-based accountability information talks about those jargony terms that we all sometimes use, collective impact. How does one thing affect another? It talks about the theory of change. How do we as organizations work together to succeed on behalf of Vermont's children? So once again, I just want to say it's a privilege to be in this role to be part of that bridge, that bridge that takes important conversations that happen at the state level and, and shares those conversations with our folks who are really doing the work on the ground, who are working in the regions, who are working in our communities. Vermont, after all, values healthy communities above all. And Vermont Insights, and with the partnership of the Vermont State Data Center and many others in this room, Vermont Insights is a tool that helps us guide our investments, helps us plan our strategies that will really make a difference in decades to come, will ensure that our children uh, that we are investing in the areas that will truly uh, bear results and make our state a healthier place. And uh, just a little plug at the very end here. Um, as you all know, data sets and data tools, doggone it, aren't stagnant. You know, you wish you could just, okay, here's the picture, let's go. But Vermont Insights, already in, well, it's been in existence 18 months or so, is already unveiling version two, a version that will be even more user-friendly, more expansive in the data that it provides. It's already up and online at vermontinsights.org, and there's a day-long meeting uh, on April 11th at Capitol Plaza which will go into a lot more depth about data, this tool, and other tools that we use to tell the story about Vermont's children. Kathleen, did I miss anything? No, that was fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you so much. Who's? So, so sure. Is this the one? I might turn back up. <clears throat> oh, my name tag. Hi there, I'm Sue Zeller, and uh, three years ago I was uh, tapped. I was the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Finance doing the budget to take this first position of Chief Performance Officer for the state. Initially, uh, somewhat in advance, but in reaction to Act 186, which was where the legislature adopted, although it's not named that it's RBA, you can tell, um, population level outcomes and the suggested initial indicators. Can I just pause you? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure everybody knows what RBA is. Can you just RBA, Results Based Accountability. And it's a system created by Mark Friedman, who was the former budget director in the state of Maryland and who uh, had the challenges, like we all do, of trying to figure out how to make the money go where it needs to go and how to evaluate whether that's um, we're getting the results that we wanted. And so he decided there had to be a better way than the traditional ways that we do things of incremental or anecdotal or who has the better lobbying uh, success. And so he built this framework 
of how to measure what you're doing, set goals, and ask yourself, how much did we do? How well we did we do it? And is anyone better off? <clears throat> So before I get started in talking about how I've gotten to where we are and how the state's gotten to where we are, the first thing I want to say is I am so jealous of Vermont and Sight. <laughs> I am so jealous. <clears throat> it's yours. Okay, love it. Um, <clears throat> I know that there are a number of organizations, a lot of nonprofits, who are using results-based accountability. Some of them are doing their own independent reporting using tools like Tableau or whatever. Um, and some of them are using the res results policy. What's the name of the organization? Leadership, leadership group, right. Results leadership group tool for a results scorecard, which Drew is going to talk about. I know. Um, uh, home Health and Hospice does RBA, um, the Food Bank does RBA, anybody else here that's using RBA effectively? Okay, so, um, so I'm jealous of all of you because somehow you found a way to marshal your desire and your passion and your limited staffing and resources, and believe me, I get limited staffing and resources, to do this. I've had a good success with um, legislative support and the support from the nonprofit community and some internal early adopters, one of which is the Agency of Human Services. We've also had, uh, in addition to RBA, or rather in collaboration with RBA, we have some departments, and if you want to think about those departments more as operational, transactional departments, using Lean. Has anybody ever heard of Lean? It's more of a of an op operational step. You know, it comes from the it comes from Toyota. It comes from the manufacturing, um, you know, world about how many steps does something take to get from point A to point B, and do we really need all those steps? So the agency of within the agency of natural resources, the Department of Environmental Conservation is really building on that, and they have done a number of events um, and really built capacity into their programs and their process, um, therefore not doing more with, with the same amount of money. Now the Agency of Transportation is on board and they are beginning to do that. So uh, Drew Restley here and myself and uh, a representative from the DEC and a representative from AOT, we formed a little group and we're trying to work on a sort of a statewide plan about continuous improvement. And whether you are using, and RBA works so well to set those high level population um, outcomes. Vermonters are healthy. Vermont has a prosperous community. And can work very well to set your individual indicators. How are you going to measure that Vermonters are healthy? You're looking at low birth weights. You're looking at how many uh, pregnant women receive um, prenatal care. You're looking at immunization rates. And then when you get down to the actual performance measures, depending upon your department and what you're trying to measure, you may be measuring a program that is serving um, your group. And so you're going to want to measure how the results are coming out. But if you're in a department where you're issuing permits, OK, that's a little bit different. It isn't a success just to issue a permit. You want to issue it quickly, without errors, and you want to not have a big backlog. So that's more about, if you'll think about it, production, OK? So we're trying to develop a plan that blends these two together. The Lean, Lean Speak uses a similar terms. They call a performance measure a KPI, which is Key Performance Indicator. OK, fine. Same thing. So we're trying to meld this together. And um, we're ready to go promote this entire process to the gubernatorial candidates this summer. And I urge you, I ask you, I plead with you to talk to your legislators, talk to your gubernatorial candidates. I don't care which one it is. Um, the thing that I think is the most challenging for all of us is we've done so much work. 
I'm, I'm thrilled when I walk into um, a performance meeting where people are having discussions about turning the curve or I walk into a lean group where people are talking about how they can change the process. The power that's in that room, the excitement that's in that room is truly palpable. And in my 10 year history, this is the third initiative like this that I've been a part of and it's the one that's gotten the furthest and it's the one that has the broadest support and it's the one that I've become the most excited about but the last two got overturned by the next administration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so please, get, this is so important to all of us and it's, so, it's such exciting work. I know we're understaffed, I know we don't have the right tools, I know we don't have the right resources, but we just need to keep pushing on and the way to ensure that is to make sure that we have a commitment from the new <coughs> administration coming in and that you're able to come to the legislature, which they are committed. Actually, they're kind of a bit of a runaway train this session. They've been so committed, we're like, stop, stop. Um, <laughs> and it's, this is fun. It's a lot of work, and I'm, I would, anybody that's not doing this and working with the data and trying to make inroads, it's not easy. It's work, but it's rewarding work. And it's just so great to be able to tell the story, and that's what it's all about, telling the story, okay? So, uh, oh yes, this is the cartoon report that Lauren Glenn has up there. <laughs> I don't have the nice tools, like oh, Building good. Bright Futures and Scorecard, so we use what we have. And um, this is the Act 186 report that uh, talks about the, the uh, nine outcomes and uh, 80 indicators, I think, that we have currently have. And the legislature loved it. Now, I got a lot of pushback from people, and they said, my God, I haven't seen clip art in 100 years. <laughs> and I said, I don't have money to develop cool-looking icons. So I, you use what you have. So this is why I call it my cartoon report. But it's just a brief. It's, it's eye-catching, silly, cartoonish, but it caught their attention. They actually looked at it. Only a little narrative, one chart. But behind all of the AHS ones, they lead right into the link and they lead right into the Agency of um, Human Services scorecard tool, which I'll have, um, have Drew talk about next. I mean, my ideal world, we'd be all on scorecard. We'd be sending data directly to uh, Vermont, Vermont Insight. And anybody out there that wanted to pick the data from particular programs on particular topics, early childhood, or maybe you want to look at economic development training programs, all the training programs that have to do with job creation or job betterment. You could pull all the data down from that. That would be my dream. Okay, but as you guys know, first of all, we have to keep the momentum going forward into the next administration. And then like everything, how can we effectively build capacity? How can we collectively do things together better? Right? How can we share the resources that we have for us, for Vermonters in particular, and for general citizenry to understand how hard the state works, how hard the nonprofits work. We're all doing this for a reason, and that's because we care. So, so just to let people know, mm -hmm. how do they find this data? Well, um, you can just go to vermont.gov, and um, you'll see, see that spotlight, black spotlight thing. You'll find that right on the home page of uh, vermont.gov, or you can go to vermont.spotlight.gov. And scroll, there it is, you'll see that black thing. This is our state uh, fiscal transparency site, and since I didn't have any place else to put performance accountability, I put it there. And there's a lot of good information. There are newsletters, there are reports on lean, there are uh, uh, sort of strategy discussions, and a lot of reports, including the infamous cartoon report. So, um, so would that we had scorecard, results scorecard to use across the board. 
I love that. And so I'm going to have Astro Wrestley, the performance improvement manager, to show you that tool, which is, I think, a very cool tool and has a lot of versatility and you can sort of customize it to your needs. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at it statewide because it would be more for, for lean or, or aim or balanced scorecard or any of the other methodologies for process and, uh, and results improvement. Thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the things I'm about to say. Um, I have a PowerPoint which I will run through because it will keep me on, um, you know, on point. But I'm going to try to not rely on it because I would also love to hear from folks in the room who have experience with results-based accountability or performance management, collective impact. Um, and who may or may not be, f be familiar yourself with what it takes and what's actually useful about being able to present data and use data. Um, but I also just want to thank everyone who's spoken before me for as least, at least as long as I've been here, which is probably the last, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. Um, very inspiring. Data can be and feel and seem really, really dry, but it's not. It's every piece of data tells a story. Um, and we have the opportunity through Act 186, our state outcomes bill, um, and with the implementation of results-based accountability across sectors in Vermont to choose what story we're telling um, and what to do with the data that tells us what story. And I think that that's a really powerful, um, that's a really powerful tidal wave in Vermont right now. And I'm so grateful to be up here with BBF and Vermont Insights and Sue to talk about what we can at least offer to that conversation. Um, so, reality check, yes. And so my life is now PowerPoint and Dilbert cartoons, <laughs> but I think I'm grateful for that. I don't know if anybody can read these, but they essentially are getting at the point that um, data on a dashboard in itself doesn't actually do anybody any good necessarily. What data you're talking about and what you're actually doing with partners um, is what makes the data valuable and useful. Um, so. Let's see, do I want to launch right into, before I launch right into exactly what the scorecard is, I think I would say that, um, can I have another show of hands about people who are familiar with results-based accountability? Okay, so that's a lot of people. I think results-based accountability speaks to the agency of human services in two primary ways. Um, the first is in recognizing our responsibility to community empowerment and um, supporting community collaboration and being a partner at the table, recognizing that we are a huge partner at the Agency of Human Services in improving conditions for individuals and families, um, but that we can't do it alone. The Agency of Human Services and not one of the six departments that comprises the organization can take on any one of these complex challenges without our partners in the community um, and without other partners in state government and without the individuals and families that we work with. The second um, responsibility that results-based accountability helps us recognize is to performance management. So yes, we're a huge partner. We administer our own programs and we support community programs financially. What are we doing to help and empower staff and management to manage performance toward um, improving strategies that work? Using data to reflect the experience of staff who are providing direct services, for instance trying to get rid of all the mindless data reporting that we get used to and actually thinking about what are the pieces of data that tell us a story about the interaction we're having with, with individuals, families, and communities. Um, and so I think the scorecard is appropriately set up following the results-based accountability framework to give organizations and communities a tool to move from setting desired conditions of well-being and moving toward what strategies are going to work to make a difference and then helping you monitor those strategies to, to fulfillment. So um, yeah, thank you, Lauren Glenn. That's helpful. Um, these are just a couple of little um, images that I stole off of the Results Leadership Group's website that show the different, um, the different capabilities of the tool. Uh, there's actual scorecards, which is what I'm going to spend my time talking to you about. There's also strategy visualization, helps you sort of map out the different components and the different partners that are at play in any given, given situation to improve performance or make a difference in the community. 
program management, this is like kind of the boring part, but how you actually bring a strategy to fruition, and data sharing. So what's actually happening across organizations and communities internationally that we could learn from and draw from? Who came up with a really meaningful, perfect proxy indicator for a condition of well-being that we're trying to achieve? How, how do they measure it? Um, like an international learning community. Um, so I kind of just talked about this, but the scorecard follows the results-based accountability logic in that you identify a population outcome and a population indicator by which you'll measure progress towards achievement of that outcome. It allows you to see data over time. It prompts you to tell um, the story behind the curve. What are the causes and forces at work behind this population level indicator? Why has it been going down for the past three years, or why have we seen skyrocket improvements in communities? Um, it also, you can stay up there for a second, Lorna. Um, partners, who has a role to play? We recognize that not one agency or program can make a difference on their own, so who's, who has a role to play? What works? What are the strategies we know works? Evidence-based practices? Um, what's worked in other states? What's worked in our own history that perhaps we lost funding for, or et cetera, et cetera? Um, and strategy, what do we actually propose to do? Having all of this information attached to a trend line um, is essentially the results scorecard's way to prompt you into action, right? So it prompts you with all the right questions at the right times to think, okay, so what are we actually doing about this? Um, and then right below that, you can go back up, Lauren Glenn, just for a second. Then there's programs and performance measures. So what are the various sets of programs or strategies or service systems that are contributing to making a difference in that population level outcome or to a trend line um, improvement in an indicator? Um, and I think that the program performance section of the scorecard is what the Agency of Human Services is finding to be most valuable now internally, or it's where we're doing the most exploration, knowing that there are incredible opportunities like Vermont Insights that we want to support and build off of in our own way to promote, um, to promote community access to meaningful data. I think right now, the Agency of Human Services, and I'll talk about this a little more, is thinking about the performance management capabilities of the scorecard. How can we change our practice so that we're regularly monitoring information that's most meaningful to us about some of our most impactful programs? Um, and I also think that for nonprofit organizations in the room, um, there might be a similar benefit to thinking about the scorecard through a performance accountability lens. It's the most sort of immediately accessible. Yeah. About why nonprofits and how nonprofits in the room could use the scorecard in their own work. Yes, definitely. Um, so, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, is there something? Yes. Can you go down a couple slides, Lauren Glenn? Um, one more, one more actually. This, yeah, this one. So, I, I suspect that in a nonprofit organization, this dialogue happens in a similar way to a large agency. What is the use of showcasing data if the data is not actually meaningful to you? The scorecard is a tool for, for data presentation and for building action plans and for presenting information to the public or to your board or to your staff. It's a way that you can, in you know, sort of real time, assess a trend line and then strategize for how you're going to make a difference. But it depends on a lot of things. It depends on having an understanding and appreciation for performance management and performance improvement in your organization. It depends on having had a conversation that perhaps you, can, you could have used results-based accountability to um, found that would allow you to identify the strongest and most meaningful performance measures, not just the data that you collect to send off to the state or to another funder, but that actually helps you motivate staff to, make, to, um, to do better. And this is just a little continuous improvement cycle that we use at the Agency of Human Services to try to understand what are all those component factors in a system. I think the scorecard is most helpful to us in that third bubble from the top, monitoring performance, and the fifth one, communicating performance. It allows us to be transparent about our monitoring activities and about the information that we're trying to use to drive decision making. Um, the scorecard, I mean, on, on a very logistical level, the scorecard is a is a, um, a pretty inexpensive tool, relatively inexpensive tool that you can use, but I think the real benefit comes from its direct um, 
from its direct relationship with results-based accountability. It's a tool for collective impact that you can use in your communities as a backbone organization or as an organization participating in a collective impact project um, and for your own performance management purposes. Did that speak to what you were looking for? So the Agency of Human Services scorecards are, <laughs> for the most part, available through our website. Also, if you just Googled Act 186 scorecard, you would see our Agency of Human Services report, which is population level indicators that you may be interested in. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on that, but... So the point of this panel was to really give you an overview of the data that's available for us to be using in our advocacy modes. And clearly there's more to say, so I'm sorry to be cutting us short on this discussion. Um, just to wrap up, maybe Martha, you have a question just, or a comment? I just mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand how all these connect. Mm -hmm. Because we yes. just heard about, I think, some pretty incredible investments being made and three tools. I think the Blueprint for Health has another one. Are, is, is, are these connecting in any way, or are these four separate efforts? I, I could start there. Mm -hmm. that and would, we don't have would, any time, but just no, as an outsider listening, I'm just thinking, yeah. I don't get it. So, so one, of, yeah. one of the things that we had discovered, and Drew, and we've all been working together, so, so we're not siloed. Um, but one of the things that we discovered in Vermont Insights is the acquiring of the data, bringing it to a place, and being able to push it out. So you can have a scorecard, but you still need to put your data in the scorecard. And as soon as we started our work, we realized that let's build out functions where we can actually get data in through data sharing agreement, whether it be AHS, AOE, Commerce, the Gross National Happiness, the Census Bureau, bring it in to a repository and build out the tools that then can push it out. So whether you use Results Scorecard, which has a framework, or whether you use another tool, an atlas or whatever, you can push it out. So our work in BBF has been really to say build something that you can bring data into a place, but you can also push it out. Because these scorecards are really come as a tool without the data. And that's the hard part. We have been, from the day one, it's been about, I always say that, you know, trying to find the data, and it takes up all your energy. By the time you get to use the data, you're pretty tired out because you spend a lot of your resources and time finding the data. Mm -hmm. So that's where the connection is, and we're moving in that direction. So our goal is to say, Sue, you can use this tool that we have in Vermont Insights to produce your report, or Drew vice versa, or Drew to be sharing data with us. So it's a real bila you know, bilateral. So that's where we are. The state is working the with Well, uh, we built out the tool to push it out. The state and we is. Do it with ECOS. And we do it with and the state also has a pilot open data process going on where ultimately all of this data could be sent and reside in different data sets that you could then pull the pieces that you want into your own tool. Okay, because remember all these things are just tools that depend on the ability to have data that you select from uh, one tool and pull it into your tool and manipulate it the way you want it the view. And also, I think it's important just to know that these folks are talking with each other. Michael Mosher from the Vermont Data Center is in on these conversations. I mean, there are, there is the Vermont Data Collaborative. There are a variety of tables where people are sitting to talk about the exchange and sharing. The Vermont Accountability Group is another example of those. So um, we certainly are glad if folks have questions about that to answer them. And I would just say, just in the interest of the agenda, um, that I'm going to wrap up. If you have particular comments or questions you'd like to make to come to speak for the panelists, um, I know that folks are hungry for lunch. So um, we're going to break for lunch. And actually, that's a wrap of the program today. But hopefully, you will spend the afternoon talking with each other, um, finding your legislators, and sitting in on the committees uh, that are meeting, and that list is in your, um, in your packet.